everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. I'm Erica Bloom, Community Marketing Associate at Springer Publishing. For those of you who don't know, Springer Publishing is an award-winning publisher of nursing and healthcare content featuring books, apps, journals, and digital products. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce today's pre presenter, Tyler Tracer. Tyler is an assist assistant professor of nursing at the University of Pittsburgh and a clinical staff nurse for the UPMC Health Systems in Pittsburgh, PA. Tyler's scholarly emphasis and practice focus on improving the health and well-being of LGBTQ people, and he is recognized as a clinical expert in LGBTQ health. Tyler is also the author of the soon-to-be-released Fast Facts About LGBTQ Plus Care for Nurses coming this September. Before we get started, I want to mention that this webinar will be recorded. If you miss any portion of the presentation, you can find the video on Springer Publishing's website five to seven days post event. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation, and if you forget to ask a question, there will be a brief survey sent at the end of the webinar that you can include your question. Now, without further ado, we'll turn it over to Tyler. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Tyler. I'm excited to talk to you folks today, um, guide you through this presentation here, um, uh, talking about LGBTQ plus people and how we as nurses can provide them with competent care, whether it's uh, patients we're caring for, um, employees, coworkers, students, et cetera, um, talk about different ways that we can improve their care. So other things we'll cover throughout the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour, we'll talk about key terms and definitions related to LGBTQ uh, people in health, talk about different strategies that you can implement in your nursing care and practice to create these inclusive and welcoming environments. <clears throat> and then other strategies and behaviors um, to provide that care to their patients and families um, in all practice settings. So first we'll talk about LGBTQ plus people in health. We'll dive into a little bit of a background and history there and talk about that. Um, to kind of give us a basis uh, to guide our nursing care and our discussion. Um, first, though, I want to just get an understanding of people who are on the webinar to see how much time you may have. Um, did your program, your nursing program, spend teaching you on LGBTQ plus health? So, um, for those of you, maybe this is in your um, bachelor's, your associate's, doctoral, or master's, when you think of your nursing education, but how much time did you spend there? Um, so it could be none at all, one to three hours, more than three hours, or you could also be unsure, just to help give myself an understanding of um, where the audience lies. So I'll give you folks a minute to do that. Awesome, so looking at the results here, about 61% of you said none at all. A few of you did say about a quarter, um, one to three hours. Some said more than three hours, which is great. So about uh, two people had that. So it's really awesome to hear. And then a few folks were unsure. Um, so as you can see, it's something that's not routinely covered in nursing curriculums. Um, we don't see it um, anyone where in the curriculum and we're seeing some trouble where to place that information. How do we make it more mainstream and more pertinent to the students as they're caring for that? Um, and then for our nursing practice, as we're ongoing too, like how do we incorporate it into continuing education, whether it's at the hospital, um, or practice setting. Uh, so great. So we'll kind of talk about more of this stuff here as we go on. Um, so what is LGBTQ? So it's a very big acronym that encompasses a very large population and a very diverse population when we think about this. There's a big benefit to using the acronym LGBTQ because it uh, defines a population. We're able to have this umbrella term for research, for understanding um, when we talk about sexual orientation and gender identity, these minority people, it gives us a term to encapsulate them under. However, on the other side of that, what it does is it can cause a lot of like focusing on the acronym. We get caught up in these letters and we um, don't appreciate the nuance between each population that falls under this acronym and we kind of lump them all under this umbrella. So we have to understand that each letter um, has its own unique population, their own unique access to healthcare and their own experiences. Um, that falls under that um, acronym. And then the acronym is always changing. You know, we see LGBT, then we saw the addition of the Q within the last probably 10 years. Um, we see LGBTQIA, some people may see a plus in there, there may be a two, an S, and we see it, um, the acronym grow and change over time. As we see our um, 
description of sexual orientation and gender identity minorities change as well. Um, but as of now, the term that I'm using is LGBTQ. That is what's um, one of the most accepted ones out there is now. Like I said, you may see IA and other additions on there. Um, but LGBTQ stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans transgender, and queer questioning. So the first three letters at LGB, those look at your sexuality. So those look at your attractions. So lesbian is someone who's attracted, a woman who's attracted to women. Gay is a man who's attracted to men. Bisexual may be a person who's attracted to both sexes. And then you have transgender, which is its own unique facet there because that looks at their gender identity and whether they don't align with their birth sex. So um, you have someone who may be born biologically male, but they're, they identify their gender as a female. And then you have queer and questioning. So questioning could be a person who's questioning either their sexuality or their gender identity um, and someone who may be on that journey themselves to understand. So they may say that they're um, bisexual. They may say that they're gay. They may not be, just be unsure about where they may end up. And then we have queer, which is an up and coming term that we're seeing a lot of our youth and younger um, folks in this population used to identify themselves. Um, we're seeing queer used to identify the entire community because I've seen folks refer to queer as a way to not use the letters and cause decisiveness between the community and it's a way to encompass the entire LGBTQ plus community in one setting. Um, and then it could be a way that people feel that the term lesbian or the term transgender doesn't fully encapsulate who they identify as instead of identifying as that they identify just as a queer person and that could queer could capture both their sexuality and or their gender identity so it's a very um, personal term however just caution with the term queer um, it's not something that i would use um, in all clinical settings when describing this population because it was once used as a derogatory term um, for this community so some people may have some trauma associated with that word um, so we want to make sure that we want when people are using these identifications that we're sharing the language that they're sharing with us. But like I said, it's ever evolving. Um, so we want to focus more on the individual and the person or the group than we do um, focusing on that um, letter, the acronym there. So like I mentioned, we can talk about sex, sexuality, and gender. And a way to think about these is to think of them more on a spectrum than as a binary um, point of it either being yes or no. Or male or female. So when we look at it on a spectrum though, we can look at biological sex and we know that we have male and female because that's made up of our anatomy, our chromosomes, and our hormones. Um, we do have a small percentage of the population that falls under there as intersex. So those are folks who may be born with um, both male and female hormones and chromosomes and they may have you know external or internal um, anatomy representative of both sexes. Oftentimes their sex is chosen for them at birth by their parents. And we're seeing that this can cause some long-term trauma in these individuals who later in life may not align with the sex that was chosen for them, or they're now having to be on long-term hormonal therapies and other um, medications because of the decisions made at their birth there. Um, so gender identity, that's a psychological sense of self. So every person on this call, whether you think about it when you wake up in the morning or throughout your day, you have this gender identity. So it's that psychological sense of self. So do you identify as a man to identify as a woman? Do you fall somewhere in that spectrum in between there? Do you consider yourself bi-gendered, two-spirited, or third gender? So two-spirited is a unique term used by the indigenous uh, population of the Americas. Um, so a term for pre-colonial America there, um, each tribe had their own term that was used for two-spirited. Two-spirited came about in the 1980s, um, but two-spirited was used by those tribes to describe folks who were um, transgender during those times or folks who were kind of in that middle between man and woman. Um, these folks were often people of power in the um, indigenous tribes. They were sought out. Um, they were uh, well respected. Um, so it's, not, it's something to think of that like people who are transgender or people who have a gender identity that doesn't fit within man or woman. It's not something that we just thought of in the last five, 10 years. We look at it, we can see um, this representation of this fluid gender identity found all throughout our history, you know, in the Americas, we can see it in the um, Pacific Islands, we can see it in Middle Eastern, we can see it in Europe. Um, so it's always been around there in the sense of self, we see that we have those different attributes there. Then we have gender expression and attribution. So this is how we as individuals communicate um, and also perceive gender ourselves. So again, every person listening in on this call you know, we have 
various ways that we express our gender. So we can be more masculine in our appearance and our speech, um, our clothing, our hair, our nails. Uh, we can be more feminine or we can fall somewhere along there in the middle there in this androgyny. And we can see the spectrum play out. You know, some folks may wake up one day wanting to feel more masculine. Next day, they may want to feel more feminine or they could have this combination of both of those attributes as well. And the important thing with uh, gender expression to understand too is depending on the culture and time that you live in, what is masculine and feminine can change over time. What is accepted as masculine could vary as well. You know, we can see in the Americas today, like in the United States, masculinity, um, what it used to be in the 1800s, you know, men wore powdered wigs, they wore the um, little high heeled shoes in different areas. And then that kind of changed to um, not being of our time now. So we don't see that anymore. You know, we see kilts in Scottish um, regalia, which is would be a feminine attribute here in the Americas. And then in like indigenous tribes in African places, we see makeup, piercings, tattoos that may be feminine in other areas be considered masculine. So depending on your time and place of where you are, gender expression attribution can uh, change and what that acceptability is by that mainstream there. And then at the bottom, we have our sexual orientation. So again, looking at it on a spectrum, you could have folks who are attracted to women, attracted to men. You could have folks somewhere along that continuum that may be bisexual, um, meaning that they prefer men and women, or pansexual with pan meaning all, or folks who are asexual who just don't feel that they have any romantic or erotic response to folks as well. Um, so again, this could change as people um, are going about their own self-discovery of where they fall in that um, spectrum and that continuum. And again, sexual orientation is something that we've seen throughout um, history as well. You know, we see it in Greek mythology, we see it um, throughout that stem. So it's not something, again, very new, but a very natural um, human instinct. So why do we want to talk about LGBTQ health? Why is it important in nursing to understand and want to learn about this so we can provide that care? Uh, well, Healthy People 2020 was the first healthy people that put um, sexual orientation, gender identity information um, on the federal landscape. So it gave us um, metrics for how to track data, how to collect data, and what we wanted to use that data for. And then now it has further been included in Healthy People 2030 with further um, goals and data collection priorities that are set in there as well. Um, and then stemming from that, we saw the Centers for Medicare, Medicaid, and other places want to collect this information. The Joint Commission, similar to their um, groundbreaking report to Air as Medicine, they released one for LGBTQ health back in 2011 that highlighted the um, health disparities faced by this population. Or sorry, that was the Institute of Medicine. They released that in 2011, um, which kind of paved the way and gave us this um, information to show us here are the health that exist, how do we tackle these, how do we address these, how do we improve these areas. Um, and it was really the first like collective data that really put that in the national spotlight as well and put those healthcare disparities out there. And then the Joint Commission, they also released a roadmap to equality. So to be Joint Commission accredited for those of you who work in different hospital settings, you have to have two points related to LGBTQ health, um, a non-discrimination policy and a visitation policy. And then they also recommend LGBTQ plus training for healthcare providers, whether at initial and ongoing. So they really released a framework and roadmap for us to create more inclusive hospitals and caring centers in that area. So we're seeing more focus on that. We're seeing um, accredited accreditation bodies, we're seeing um, reimbursement models, looking to see how are we addressing LGBTQ plus health, how are we addressing these minorities and um, dismantling those healthcare disparities. So when we look at the history of LGBTQ health um, and what's current, so about 3.5 to 4% of the US population or about 11 million Americans identifies LGBTQ. So when we look at that population, that's about the state of New Jersey. So it's a very large um, population that we have here in the United States of America. We're seeing more and more folks um, come out. Um, before, the it was closer to the 3%, and we're seeing about 4% um, identify as LGBTQ+, and this could be for a myriad of reasons. So we're seeing um, more acceptance, so people feel more comfortable being out um, and identifying as LGBTQ+. We're seeing... Um, with that greater social acceptance, we're seeing people come out later in life, people coming out younger in life. Um, so they feel that there's no um, harm for them to come out. 
until 1973, homosexuality was listed as a disorder in the DSM. So up until that time, we were able to pathologize homosexuality so we could treat it via um, various medical interventions such as conversion therapy, electroshock, castration. So in nursing and medicine, we used to have this pathological belief in how we would treat and approach um, homosexuality. However, we've seen that um, go away and we still see conversion therapy used to this day. Many places, many states, local municipalities have outlawed that use, and a lot of major um, healthcare organizations have come out um, against that type of therapy there. Um, but what that did was it said that this is no longer a mental illness, and this is just normal human behavior. In 2015, we saw same-sex marriage ruled constitutional by the Supreme Court. So this allowed... Um, a paradigm shift in the United States, you know, we had the Defense of Marriage Act, and um, we saw the sodomy laws go down in the 2000s and various things. So what this do did was it created equality across the board for folks. So we're seeing, we're going to see improved um, lives because of this. We're going to see people know that, oh, the federal government has now accepted um, that same-sex marriage is legal. So my identity as a gay and lesbian person or transgender is more valid. Um, Last year, we saw the Supreme Court also rule in favor of um, the Title IX protections and non-discrimination um, extend to include um, sexual orientation and gender identity. So again, we're seeing more protections for these people, um, more safety nets in place so people are able to live their lives um, as LGBTQ plus people. So that way they are more healthy. Um, we don't see that stigma and discrimination. And then we're seeing better mainstream visibility. So we're seeing TVs, movies, and music um, feature uh, queer artists and LGBTQ plus people. And we're seeing not just for those folks, but also um, people of color and other places. While there's still absolutely room to grow, we're seeing less stereotypes and tropes used about these populations. We're seeing them be presented more in like an everyday life about how um, we all live the same lives here, um, whether we're gay or straight or black or white. Um, we're seeing more positive visibility in that aspect. Again, as we were going to move to even make it better. Um, but it's nice to see if you look at like movies or shows from the 90s and 2000s to today, um, the cringeworthy moments that we may have seen before we're not seeing as much today. Um, but with this history and where we're at, we're seeing this progression, we're seeing a change in our um, landscape here. And us as healthcare professionals, this is important because, you know, in the last 10 years, why um, we want to understand this history is we saw the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell under the Obama administration. So for those of you who may work with veterans and the Veterans Association, um, this is important because that's a generation of people who lived under Don't Ask, Don't Tell who could be disbarred from the military for their sexual orientation or gender identity. So they hid this part of their lives. Um, I attended a talk by a woman who was, she identified as she was black, she was disabled and she was a lesbian. It was a great talk about like access in America. And she talked about her wife and how to this day, even though she's been out of the military for the last 10 years um, and don't ask, don't tell was repealed. Um, she still gets a lot of anxiety and hesitation holding her wife's hand in public because it's just, she was ingrained in so long about that being wrong or having to hide that. So when working with these veterans, we have to understand how do we communicate with them? How do we acknowledge that harm that was done or that trauma that may be associated there? And how do we, welcome them into an accepting environment that we as nurses, um, we do care about you and um, we don't want you to hide that information because we know that's a part of your life. So with the um, population, uh, LGBTQ plus people, they don't have their own unique health disparities. So they have the same healthcare problems that we see with the cisgender or um, straight counterparts that are out there and um, people who identify as cisgender or as like male and female with as their birth sex. So what happens then is we have this stigma and discrimination that within our society that creates this chronic and acute stress. And this chronic and acute stress then impacts someone's access to mental health, physical health, their access to care and their access to competent care. And that in turn is what creates these health disparities and inequities. So when we look at this acute stress and chronic stress of uh, being a minority population, we have to think of the phenomenon known as minority stress. So what minority stress means is that I could be a minority person I could be a gay person who's never been discriminated against in my life, but I know friends and individuals who have been discriminated against, or I've read it in the news, or I saw it on a blog online. So I'm going into the healthcare arena with this anticipation that it's going to happen to me. So people are going to be hyper vigilant and they're going to expect the worst to happen. So then, as we as healthcare providers, if we make an honest mistake, people see that as a wrongdoing. 
So then that's going to impact their physical health, that mental health, that access care, because now they're afraid to go to care or they're hypervigilant and that vigilance causes stress because they're always on alert. And then we have to work double time to kind of step back to gain that trust again because we, um, because of the stress. So how do we interrupt that stress and work with that? And communication is a key point there um, when dealing with that. And we'll talk about some of those techniques coming up. But understanding that when LGBTQ plus people come into our care that we may have the best intentions, but they're just waiting for us to slight them. Um, to kind of talk with this, I had a, as when I was a unit director on a medical oncology unit, I had a transgender patient, um, her name was Kayla, and um, our EHR system didn't allow us to put in their, um, her name, Kayla. We had to use her um, male name because that legally she hadn't went through the name change process. Um, so we have to use um, by law, you know, your identification as your driver's license, which is that um, that name. So anytime dietary would bring this person's tray into their room, they would use her old name. Um, so she kept saying, no, that's not who I am. Or she would say her name is Kayla. So then dietary would take the tray away. And then she felt that she was being discriminated against, that no one wanted to feed her or else we didn't want to respect who her name was. So what I did in my role was go in and talk to um, Kayla about our expectations here was her prior, our number one goal is her safety. We wanna make sure that she is getting the right treatment at the right time and the right, you know, we don't want you to take you to the wrong test. We don't wanna give you the wrong medication. So there may be times where we have to use your previous name because that is legally what is on your identification card. Any other time where we're able to, we will call you Kayla. And any time that we use your previous name, it is not to um, disrespect you. It's not to cause harm. It's not to, um, not acknowledge the fact that you are a transgender person and this is your identity and who you are. But the reason we do this is for your own safety and we wanna make sure that we're always giving you the best possible care. And having that conversation with her, it probably took 10 minutes navigating through that. She really felt relieved and, respect and respected because she honestly thought that we were purposely just not using her name and didn't understand that because of, you know, when we had to scan and ask your name or birth date those safety checks that are in place. So really communicating these steps that we're taking for especially transgender people because they will be hypervigilant. So how do we um, change that? So that way when she's there, we're not impacting her mental or physical health because we're she feels that we're um, purposely um, misgendering her. So when we look at healthcare disparities faced with this population, you know, um, we see high rates of substance abuse, we see high rates of tobacco use amongst lesbians, high rates of drug use amongst gay men, we see high rates of depression and mental health, um, bullying, suicide marginalization, we see high rates of suicide with transgender folks. Um, we do see higher rates of STIs, HIV and AIDS, um, obesity, overweight, HPV associated cancers, but hopefully with the uptake of the HPV vaccine, we'll see this decrease over time. Intimate partner violence and domestic violence, we do see high rates of that within the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community. Um, and what makes this community unique with intimate partner violence is that if I were a transgender person, and again, if my identification doesn't match the gender that I'm passing as or that I, I am, so if my ID says I'm a man, but I am a transgender woman, I may be denied asylum at a women's shelter and be forced to go to a men's shelter um, where I could be the victim of like harassment or abuse. So it may be hard for transgender folks to get out of these situations because they don't have anywhere to turn because we don't have safety nets for them um, in some of those places. And then we'll see our uh, LGBTQ plus youth, they're more likely to be homeless um, and that could be because they like ran away because of fear of coming out to their parents or they could have been incidentally outed or came out to their parents and um, kicked out of their housing that they have. So then we see them engaging in high risk behaviors as well, because obviously when we think of Maslow's home and health is their number one priority. Um, so for transgender folks, we see some barriers to medical care in addition to what we talked about there. So we see this um, population, they're usually economically disadvantaged. Um, we'll see geographic and social, social isolation. So a lot of our transgender specialty clinics are gonna be in our urban areas. So for folks who are in our more rural areas, um, they may not have um, the access to get to these urban areas. So hopefully with the uptake of telehealth, we'll see um, better access for these folks and they may not have um, people in their region where they can reach out and talk to, you know, they may be the only transgender person in that community. Um, 
lack of insurance coverage, so not all places may cover gender affirming um, procedures and care. Um, or their jobs may not cover that. We may we see a lack of clinical research and we have limited medical literature on transgender patients. Um, so what are the long-term effects of this hormonal therapy? Um, gender affirmation, you know, quality of life. So this is a big area um, of potential for nursing research and medical research where we can really dive into the health and well-being of transgender people. Uh, provider ignorance. So we as nurses, we really aren't taught about um, transgender health and surgical care, even with medical providers, it's an area of specialty. So, you know, if you have a transgender person come to your uh, clinic, whether you're a nurse practitioner clinic or a nurse or at the hospital, you know, they may ask for hormones, they may ask for um, referrals. So how do we know the right treatment plans for them? And how do we get them the right care? And then just the stigma of gender, gender clinics. So um, with them going to these places, people may know they're transgender, they may lose friends or family because of that, they may lose their job depending on the state that they're in. So we see some barriers for these transgender folks. So um, as nurses, we wanna make sure that we're cognizant of that when dealing with uh, transgender people. So do you have a case manager that you work with who could navigate their insurance for them? Um, are you a nurse practitioner working in a clinic? Do you know endocrinology for hormones? Do you know a uh, gender clinic to help assist you in the uh, management of their care? Um, Suicide is a big thing for transgender folks as well. So in 2015, there was a National Transgender Discrimination Survey, and it found that about 48% of the transgender population had seriously thought about suicide. So 24% had a plan, 7% attempted, and about 40% had attempted suicide at least one point in their lives. So if you look here, first attempt by age 13, and most of them was by age 25. So we're failing our youth and we're not giving them the help that they need to affirm that gender identity. So as providers, we have to make sure when we're dealing with adolescents and youth, um, how do we uh, break this uh, cycle here and how do we validate their gender identity or provide them with information about, you know, it is okay to um, not be sure about your gender identity. So how do we um, navigate that with them? How do we give them information so that they can feel validated and feel safe in their own body and in their lives? Um, and then we as healthcare providers wanna make sure that we're acknowledging um, when we're assessing these folks as well, like are we assessing their suicidality? Do they have a plan? Have they had a history of that? So in your own clinics and um, spaces, how, what does that suicide assessment look like and how are you addressing that? And then how are you then connecting these um, transgender individuals to uh, mental health experts to really help them um, through the next stages of those? Um, for some of you on the call, you know, I, we did talk about uh, how more people feel that they can come out and things may be improving. However, when we look at the discrimination faced by LGBTQ plus Americans, this was done in 2017 by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, you can see that about 57% of them felt that they were threatened or had non-sexual harassment. 51% had sexual harassment. 51% had violence and 34% have had verbal harassment or questioning in the bathroom. This is important uh, because um, Again, as nurses, you know, you're working in an emergency room. A patient just comes in because they were attacked. This, they had violence happen to them and they identify as LGBTQ+. So they may be apprehensive, like, how are you as a nurse? How are you going to um, treat me? Are you going to say, hey, yeah, you may have deserved this, or are you going to say, treat me with dignity and respect? You know, there are some states like Ohio who just passed religious exemption rules that you as a healthcare provider could deny care to someone who is LGBTQ plus because it um, goes against your religious beliefs. So that could be a fear of them again, coming into this emergency room. Do you have, are you, if the, you are that nurse, are you able to um, maybe put that bias aside to find someone who could provide them with the care that they need? Are you able to get past us to give them that care? So these are all thoughts that, um, LGBTQ and queer people have when they come into healthcare, you know, like what's going to happen to us? How are these people going to react? So we want to make sure we're talking to them in open communication and really like at an organizational level, are you creating like we're organization that's committed to caring for these people? So caring for LGBTQ plus people in clinical settings. So how do we provide that care they've been talking about? How do we use some of these examples we talked about to um, real life practice? So first, we have to understand our bias. So every person, again, on this webinar, we have bias. So we have an unconscious and we have a conscious bias. Um, 
Our unconscious bias is often what drives us in those knee jerk reactions whenever we're encountering someone new or we're in situations, you know, and that's made up of our experiences, our geography, our culture, you know, if you've never met a transgender person, how are you going to be comfortable enough to talk to them or deliver them that care? That's where we can jump ahead of that with our conscious bias and we can, you know, learn about transgender people, we can read about them. Um, we can understand that we may encounter this person. And it's not just with LGBTQ+, this could be with people of different religions, different minorities, economic areas. Um, so how do we understand our biases, what shaped our biases, and how does that impact our nursing care? So I understand that that really just takes a reflection of, you know, what do I know about LGBTQ plus people? What are my experiences with them? And how does that spill into my care and understanding of them? Um, and this is something that we can work through um, as we learn and grow with these biases there. So when we're looking at our LGBTQ adolescents, for those of you who are working with our youth, um, things that you wanna keep in context are confidentiality and privacy. So according to the statutes of where you work and the laws, you know, what um, information can this adolescent share with you? What would you have to report if you had to, but like if they came out to you as gay, or lesbian or transgender, what information can you give them? You know, validating their sexual orientation, the questions that they have, providing them with education that they need, you know, and making sure like if this information is confidential, um, respecting that and not giving that information to their parents unless you would have to in the um, right settings because they are trusting you and maybe they're not out to their family yet. And could you incidentally outing them cause some repercussions for that individual? You know, could they be kicked out of their housing or could things happen to them? You know, if they come to you for maybe talking about the HPV vaccine for men or uh, sexual health for men and women um, and different things, how do we understand that? How do we deliver that information to them and answer those questions? Uh, mental health, so understanding that they may be at a higher risk of bullying um, because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. So um, when we're interacting with them in the office setting or in clinics, you know, what information can we give them? Um, what resources are available? Do you know mental health experts? Again, these, these youth may be apprehensive to use their insurance because then that would send a bill or a statement to their parents. So you may see these youth turn up in like clinics where they may be able to get treated or tested or seek out care without um, with that confidentiality or that anonymity that they may have there. Understanding their family and support. So what is their support look like, you know, um, and what could you give them, you know, giving them resources like if you were to be homeless, here are some shelters in the area, here are things that you can understand, um, here are some health things that you can do. And then really looking at vaccinations and preventative care. You know, if they're young, talking about the HPV vaccine, other vaccines, maybe talking about PrEP or the prophylaxis um, exposure pills to help reduce HIV um, in the high risk populations. So looking at them, really examining those adolescents and thinking, um, what are their risk factors and how can we make sure that they're engaging safely? How are we validating their sexual orientation or gender identity as providers? Again, with our own bias, understanding, you know, this is normal. Being a gay teen is a normal aspect of life and how do we validate that for them and teach them how to get through life um, when they may be bullied. For older adults, you know, considerations that we should have for them, you know, this population may be higher rates of depression. They may be more lonely. And they may be more isolated. So in some studies, we've shown that LGBT older adults could easily recognize friends before they could rely on care before families. This is a generation that grew up during Stonewall before um, marriage equality and before a lot of these advances. So they have distrust of the medical institution because um, homosexuality was uh, a disease then. They may have been, you know, the government up until the 70s, 80s, you were able to be fired for being LGBTQ. Um, you obviously don't ask, don't tell, you know, um, a lot of things in society told them that who they were is wrong. So they may be, um, or their families may have disowned them at that time as well. So they have these friends. So we want to make sure we're talking about advanced directive planning. So who are you close with? Who should make these decisions when the time comes? You know, we want to make sure that these are the friends that you can rely on for care for your families making those decisions. While I was in nursing school, I had a part-time job in a restaurant and I worked with this older man who's in his 60s, who was a gay guy, and was talking to me about how lucky I was to be growing up in this time because um, he um, had a long time partner who they then separated because um, marriage just wasn't an option for them. So they just didn't see the point of 
this long-term life that they couldn't share together. And he's like, my life would be completely different. He's like, I would probably be married and having a child, whether adopted or fostering, if that was the option for me. And was kind of like, you could tell, had this sense of sadness about the life that he missed out on because it wasn't that option while he was growing up. So we'll see that depression or loneliness amongst the population. So talking to them about those feelings, validating those existences, um, and being sure, again, that advanced directive planning and talking about them in that time. And then long-term care, you know, we're actually seeing, I live here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we're actually developing a um, senior living area that is tailored towards LGBTQ plus people. Philadelphia has one, other areas are making these areas that are more um, tailored for people who are LGBTQ plus so that they feel safe being out in their older lives um, if they have to go to these long-term care. Because, you know, for any person, it's a very um, frightening time in your life because you're giving up control of your home and where you are into these um, long-term care. So what could happen to you? So we've seen in the literature and real experiences of people going back in the closet because they're afraid of what may happen to them. There have been evidence of refusal to allow same-sex partners to room together or denials of, um, from family of choice. So if you're in the long-term care setting, making sure that the institution that you work at um, has these policies in place that allow um, same-sex partners to room together, they can have those visitations when they want to, and that people can live out in the time that they're caring there. And as nurses, we can validate that um, by asking about their lives and who they are. So um, for nurses, what we can do is we can create inclusive assessments. So when we're assessing people, whether it's on admission, whether it's the first time seeing people in your clinic, you know, we wanna do ask, do tell. Do you work in a place that collects sexual orientation, gender identity information? So we wanna ask, what was your sex at birth and what is your gender identity? And that's important to ask because um, we could miss out on important information. So if they're born a uh, female at birth, but now they identify as a man, they may have had a breast mastectomy, but they may still have um, residual breast tissue. So they still may be at risk for um, cancer screenings, you know, for breast cancer. So making sure that we are doing that in our preventative care, getting those mammograms, you know, this person, they now identify as a man, they talk like a man, look like a man. For the last 15 years, they, find themselves to be a man. So a breast cancer screening is not going to be on the top of their mind. So it's our job as healthcare providers to understand those risks so we can educate them. Um, and then what's your sexual orientation? Um, these are questions that a lot of clinics are starting to adapt. You know, we can put this in the EHR. I've seen some EHRs that even have their um, pronouns at the top of the banner. There are some EHRs that have their preferred name. And again, that could not just be for transgender folks. That could be for everyone really delivering that cultural competent care. Um, some places have portals that they can put this information in. Some of this is on paper. So just whatever would work in your situation of how you can ask for this information to guide your care. Using inclusive and neutral language. So instead of, do you have a wife or husband, boy or girlfriend? Do you have a partner? Are you in a relationship? What do you call your partner? You know, again, we may have long-term folks who are in long-term relationships who haven't got married yet because again, it just, Marriage just wasn't on the table for them for all these years, so what's the need to do that? So is, is it their spouse? Um, because if we instantly ask someone, you know, oh, where's your husband? That could then cut off the communication because the person could fear, oh, if I say I have a wife, what? how will the provider treat me differently? And then for sexual health, again, make it routine. We wanna make no assumptions. You know, we can't assume that just because someone identifies as gay or lesbian, that they're having sex with the same sex. Same thing with people who identify as straight. We can't just automatically assume that they're having sex with the opposite sex, you know? So we wanna make sure that we're asking those questions in the right context when we're doing those assessments um, and assuring that confidentiality. And the goal of this is just to make sure that we're minimizing risk. So are we doing the right screenings at the right time and offering the right medications when we can? And then for some communication best practices, and when we're working with this population, you know, we politely ask if you're unsure about a patient's preferred name or their name that they're using. So we could ask them, what name would you like us to use? I would like to be respectful. How would you like to be addressed? Um, when I was in nursing school, this is something that we learned in my foundation class was, you know, um, I see your name as X on the chart. Is there a different name you'd like us to use? You know, and that could just be because someone wants a nickname or they don't go by it the name because that's their father's name or their mother's name. So taking that same respect and pulling it into transgender folks or people whose names are different. 
asking respectfully about names that they don't match our record. So could their chart be under another name? So for transgender people, for those of you who may not work with this community, when they get their new name um, or the name that they had and it's now part of their um, documentation, it's now changed on their driver's license and every all of their documents start to match that, they'll call their previous name their dead name. So that name they just no longer use or they don't even think about that name. So for them, when they come to seek us, if they move to a new area, they may not um, give us that previous name. So unless we're asking these questions, um, again, if we about their birth, sex, and their gender identity, we may miss out on that information because, again, that's a part of their life that is now behind them and their affirmed gender. And we also want to make sure in the electronic medical records, if they did transition and their name did change, we want to make sure that we can link those charts together so we can Again, we have all that rich health history, so we're not losing that information on them. For those who may not understand their health insurance or need financial assistance, so how do we um, address those? Do you have a case manager that we can use there? Um, health insurance vast, differs so vastly, so some things are covered. You know, they may, now that they have legal documents that state that they're a man, they may have trouble getting their mammograms paid for. Um, so making sure that they know how to navigate that. Does their health insurance have a transgender clinic or hotline that they're able to navigate with that? Um, so really helping them understand those long-term um, changes with their finances and health insurance. Did you make a mistake? Always apologize. Recognize that mistake. You know, I've had friends who've transitioned um, or in the process and they have um, that new name that is a friend with their gender identity and you use the wrong name or you use the wrong pronouns and that's okay. We're all going, it's all going to happen just um, apologize for that, recognize that. And really they just want that validation that you weren't disrespecting them and that you were acknowledging um, that it was a mistake. And then always only ask for information that's required for care. You wanna ask yourself, what do I know and what do I need to know? You know, depending on where you're working in the clinical setting, there's information that you may need to know and information that you may not need to know. Um, an example of this, even though it's not, um, healthcare related, Katie Couric was interviewing Laverne Cox on national TV and asked her about what parts you have down there. Obviously was had no um, pertinence to the interview at all. And it caused a very awkward moment um, for the TV set and those participating in the interview um, and was very intrusive. So to help um, rectify her mistake there, Katie Couric did go out in partnership with National Geographic and create a documentary about gender identity to really show people, you know, this is a mistake that I made and here's how I can help other people better understand this topic so we all don't make these mistakes down the road. So just really understanding what do we need to know about our care for this population. Um, to summarize, really, we wanna create these inclusive environments and that stop starts from the top down. So are your nurse executives on board creating um, hospitals that are zero tolerance do we show that we are engaged in LGBTQ plus care? Um, when these people come through our door, how are we treating them? How are we talking to them? Um, you know, think if you work in the hospital setting and you have a transgender patient, how do you room them? What is your policy for rooming them? Um, and it may not seem something that needs to be a policy, but you wanna be able to help the people who are doing the work so that they're not making these mistakes, you know? So do they put them in a double room with their, um, birth sex or do they put them in the identity that they align with or do they go into a private room you know what's that situation so that way our nurses are able to navigate that with confidence do you have policies on how to um, interact with transgender people or how to put their um, pronouns in the electronic uh, health record and then um, do you have brochures do you have pictures do you have bathrooms like it all comes down to the environment how are we creating that how are we greeting people um, and how are us as nurses embracing that Sexual orientation, gender identity included in EHR. So are you able to capture this information? How are you capturing it? How are we using it? Because again, we don't want to create another wasteful product of the EHR, because I think if most of you are nurses on here, you know that we can get bogged down by charting. So again, we don't want to create more information that's not necessary, but this is information that can help create um, uh, inclusive environment, because if we don't ask these questions, we're essentially telling these sexual orientation, gender identity minorities that we don't care about you, we don't care about your identity. Um, and for some of these people, that may be a big part of their life or who they are, and they just want to make sure that we're caring for them in all facets. Education. So how are we educating about this? How are we seeking this out? Creating CEs, if you're a nurse educator, you know, creating CE events around this. Um, reducing and eliminating the invisibility. 
of these populations in healthcare. So again, that's by collecting this data, by having these educational events. Um, if you're a hospital, you can do the Healthcare Quality Index, which is a um, program offered by the Human Rights Campaign. They've now moved it to um, include long-term housing. If you're in higher education academia, they have various trainings for um, creating like ally spaces and safe spaces for LGBTQ plus students. Um, how do you incorporate that into your simulation in healthcare? Um, you know, do you have a transgender patient um, in simulation? How do really, how do we get that topic in there? How do we talk about that? And then acknowledging relevant days. So again, like depending on your practice setting during pride month, what is your organization doing? What are you doing as a nurse? You know, if we go out into these arenas, we're showing people, we care about this community. We want to be there. Um, World AIDS Day, Transgender Day of Remembrance. There's a lot of days that we're able to really acknowledge and really like provide education, use it as an opportunity um, to educate all the folks around us um, about this population and what's happening. And for the people in the LGBTQ plus community, it really means a lot to them because it's showing that people are taking that effort to understand like, um, oh, there's information about this community, let's share it, let's make us uh, better nurses to provide that care. Um, some references there for folks if you need further readings. Um, are there any questions that I could help answer or um, discuss? Hi, Tyler, thank you so much. Um, I'll read you some of the questions that were posted in the Q&A section and anyone that wants to write a question can do so now. Um, are there any special telehealth considerations in caring for LGBTQ patients? So I think it, those considerations would be the same as any patient. Um, I think you'd wanna make sure that the biggest thing would be um, making sure that their privacy is respected and that this information is only gonna be discussed there, you know, like how is it being saved or used? Because um, in some states you could still be fired for being LGBTQ. Um, or you could lose housing. So what's the information you're collecting over telehealth? How are you storing that information? Really making sure that that privacy component there is um, being understood. And then um, in that telehealth setting, making sure you know when you're talking about their identity, if you're doing those intake forms, is there information like, um, I notice you marked X or whatever on the form. Is this something you'd like to talk about or any more information that you need to give me? Um, I think just, we're actually seeing um, with telehealth, we're seeing more LGBTQ plus people use mental health therapy services. So we're seeing that it's been a great benefit for folks, you know, because of access. So I think um, for a lot of people who are afraid to go into a physical building, the use of telehealth has really opened up those doors because now they kind of have that like um, screen there, they're in the comfort of their own home. So that kind of takes away that anxiety of having to step into this unknown of like, maybe I'm a transgender person who is, in the process of transitioning. So now I can be at home in the comfort there and I'm not sitting in a waiting room while people like wonder, are you a man, are you a woman? Which bathroom are you going into? So I think telehealth will really help this community access healthcare and really um, improve that access. Amazing, thank you. Um, Tyler, can you go back one slide to the references? Um, someone's asking to see those. Yeah. Um, so the next question, can you explain the difference between bisexual and pansexual? Yeah, so, and that's um, within the community itself, there's even discussion of like, um, you may hear people say about the binary word, like male and female and how there's like that transgender and then there's gender queer and all that stuff there. So bisexual would be someone who is attracted to men, a man and a woman. So those are people who traditionally would be attracted to men who are um, who identify as men and women who identify as women. Where someone who is pansexual would be someone who feels that they're attracted to just a person, they're attracted to people. So they, that may be a man, that may be a woman, they're really not focused on the sexual orientation or the gender identity of the person. They're more attracted to that person and they just love. So um, pansexual in the way, in like a crude, not crude way, but like a basic way to, to um, explain it would be it's just a very more fluid version of bisexual. So someone who don't think that they live within that binary male and female. So they may like someone who identifies as transgender. They may as um, someone who identifies as non-binary, um, they may I, have an attraction to. So it's really just opening up outside of that male and female um, of that bisexual. Great. Um, so it says, 
are there ICD-10 codes we can use for transgender screenings? They're not asking for specific codes, just wondering if there are some available. Um, that I do not know. I do know with the DSM-5, what it opened up was the um, diagnosis for transgender folks of gender dysphoria. And what that coding does is it opens up um, long-term care. So people are able to get uh, further care down the road after they transition. Um, and that within the community has also caused a lot of um, angst because for transgender folks, they feel that like they don't need a physician's note to tell them that they're transgender. Um, but with our medical community for them to transition, to get healthcare, to get their hormones and stuff, they believe that they have that diagnosis to further help them get access to, you know, mental health services, to the hormonal care. Um, so for a specific ICD-10 10 code, I, I am not sure. I think um, they would have to work with the coders within your facility. Thank you. Um, can you please explain the word cultural as applied to this population? Yeah, so that is our basis of our understanding of the word culture. So when we think of culture, culture could range anything from um, community, um, it could be a group of people, it could be, um, we could look at culture from a religious standpoint, a social standpoint, we can look at it from all these other areas. So when we think of cultural, um, there's a tenants when we look at that, we can look at it from a population health standpoint, we can look at it at a community health standpoint, because LGBTQ plus people are of a minority population, they do have cultural norms within that area. So we see cultural um, norms within the lesbian population, we see it within the bisexual, and we see how we encounter the population as a whole, as a cultural way of encountering them. So um, traditionally, when we think of culture, we think of like, um, you know, it could be like a religious, you know, when we look at like Christianity and traditions that we use. And when we look at the LGBTQ population, we see those same, same um, cultural considerations that are necessary to them because it's such a broad population and the intersectionality of the population is that in which it um, it encompasses people of all races, all religions, all socioeconomic standpoints. So it's such a large population that um, each person has their own cultural background and then they have this additional cultural tenant of being a part of this LGBTQ plus community, you know? So it's a community that was created out of the stigma and discrimination of the um, majority that they had to pull together. So when we culturally wanna care for them, we wanna acknowledge this um, disenfranchisement and how they access healthcare is different from how other people access that. Great. Um, is there a nursing model that most includes LGBTQ plus patients and what did you use for your research? Yeah, so um, for myself, I use the Purnell, that's a cultural competence model by Purnell. Um, so that really guided my um, nursing research whenever I did my doctoral project of how, um, and it, he further describes culture as the one person asked there um, and really gives a great definition of culture. And then that was the model of care that I've used in my practice is the Purnell model of cultural competence. Um, is it appropriate to ask a self-identified LGBTQ plus patient how I, as your healthcare provider, can support you in on your health journey? Yeah, absolutely. Because again, um, it could be so vast difference. You know, I had a friend who's a gay man who went to his PCP because he thought he had celiac, celiac disease with because. Um, gluten sensitivities, I guess, run in his family. Um, and he was telling about how all his provider focused on was giving him an HIV test as soon as he said, oh, I'm a gay man. He's like, sure, we can do that test, but that's not really why I was here. And he said that it felt like the whole conversation focused around his HIV risk because he was a gay person. He's like, I felt like once the doctor knew that about me, this whole celiac thing was off the table. Um, so I think like asking those kind of questions really just reinforces that patient-centered care of like, you know, for some folks, their identity may be a big part of their life. And so for some folks, it may just be a small part of their life that they just happen to be a gay person. They'll talk about it, but they, that's not the real reason that they're seeking health care, you know? And again, that could all happen on their own um, experiences in life. So is this a person who maybe growing up had great support in their family life and friendship, or is this someone who did not have that, you know? Maybe they're coping with their sexuality with drugs and alcohol. So how do we, um, maybe 
by asking that question, we can further gain that information to know like, oh, you know, maybe you'll benefit from speaking with a therapist about how you can cope or how you can talk about your coming out journey. Or um, if there's someone who with their gender identity, you know, maybe they're questioning transitioning. So as a provider, you know, I know myself, I wouldn't be an expert. So um, on hormones, I know the basics of it. So how would I then get the information that I need to give them or to that person? So I think it really helps to um, provide that patient-centered care. Great, we're gonna ask one more question. Um, this says, is there a good resource to know what questions to ask trans patients? Uh, for example, about hormone replacement therapy or history of surgeries? Yeah, so um, the National LGBTQI a or um, Health Education Center. It's by the Fenway Institute. They actually have a lot of resources for folks um, and they have different um, discussions about, you know, what questions to ask during this um, health and physical assessment. So, um, and they have it broken down for each population depending on where you are and what uh, specialty you're in um, for the primary care setting. Um, so that would be a great resource to kind of find information. In my um, in the book that we're talking about here as well, um, it, one of the chapters does talk about the various questions that we can ask transgender patients. You know, like because um, we want to know where are you on hormonal therapy? How long have you been on hormonal therapy? Where are you getting your hormones? Because there could be because for some transgender people, their gender identity is going to be like their priority, so they could be getting hormones off the street from the internet. And we wanna make sure that that's not happening. Or if it is, how do we get them the hormones that they actually do need? You know, what's the follow-up? What are their desired effects? So for some transgender people, they may wanna be more masculine. They may wanna be more feminine. So do we up titrate their testosterone or we decrease it? Um, so yeah, so there's definitely tons of questions um, that we can ask uh, transgender people um, to really help make sure that we're getting their um, healthcare needs. Cause you know, not everyone wants surgery. But you know, when they do want surgery, what surgeries have they had? Have they had um, that mastectomy? Um, so yeah, so um, the Fenway Institute or the National LGBTQIA Health Education Center, they have a lot of great resources um, for transgender health as well. And there's also the WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. Um, and they're another great resource um, to use in guiding transgender medical care. Great, thank you so much, Tyler. Um, I just wanted to repeat that this video and recording will be available on our site uh, in five to seven business days. And um, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Tyler. Everyone really appreciated your presentation. Great, thank you so much for attending. Have a great day, everyone.